Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for the fifth webinar in Fish and Richardson's newly launched Life Sciences webinar series. Today's talk is entitled Navigating to the Safe Harbor, What to Know in Advance. My name is Teresa Lavoie and I'm a principal in Fish's Twin Cities office. Today I'll be presenting with my colleague Brian Coggio of our New York office. Brian also teaches patent law at Fordham University, patent litigation, excuse me, at Fordham University in New York City. Our biographies, the presentation, and the New York, New Jersey blank CLE form are available for download on your control panel. First, we hope that you and your families are healthy and safe. Due to these unprecedented times and the large number of people who are currently working remotely, we are experiencing some challenges with bandwidth. So here are a few housekeeping notes. Please keep your logins handy, and if you lose your connection, please log back in. If you experience difficulties using computer audio, please disconnect and re-log in using your phone, making sure to enter the access code and audio PIN. Today's webinar will run for one hour and includes a question and answer period at the end of the program. You may ask questions at any time throughout the program by clicking the questions section on the webinar control panel to submit your question. We will do our best to answer them all at the end of the presentation, time permitting. Feel free to contact us personally after the webinar if that's easier. Please note that a copy of the slides and a replay of the presentation will be available on our website. Before we get started, I should remind you that the opinions expressed are those of the speaker and do not necessarily, necessarily reflect the views of Fish & Richardson, PC, any other of its lawyers, its clients, or any of its or their respective affiliates. This presentation is for general information purposes and is not intended to be and should not be taken as legal advice. Can we jump ahead to slide two, please, Lauren? I'm sorry, slide three, thank you. Um, so Brian, do you wanna jump in and give a, a broad overview of the presentation today and then we can jump into the content? Sure, as you see in uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you are. <clears throat> as you can see, we have a fairly ambitious uh, agenda here with only an hour. So certain of the topics will be addressed more fully than others. Uh, we'll start off with some of the basics and stick around to the end because then we get to some of the more interesting topics, namely stockpiling, research tool, companion diagnostics, et cetera. But as you'll see as we go through the slides, they're really chock full of information and with a lot of case citations, and on occasion, articles cited that are relevant, and even legislative history. So the slides are intended to fill in any gaps that may be left by Teresa and myself. If you again have any questions, send them in. We'll try to get to them at the end, or if they're particularly pertinent to the topics under consideration at the time, maybe we can address them as we go along. So. Without further ado, the next slide, please. Okay, uh, we're going to start with the U.S. research exemption. Uh, why do we start there? Because it can be useful. Uh, in the United States, for all practical purposes, there is no research exemption. It's very narrow. Many of you, if not most of you, are familiar with Mady v. Duke. Uh, which basically said very narrow and limited to actions for porn from amusement, curiosity, et cetera. Uh, so if Duke University cannot benefit from the U.S. research exemption, I doubt if anyone on the phone or listening in can. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, here we are. So why do I spend time on it if it really doesn't exist, right? Well, the research exemption does exist in Europe. And for many multinational companies, it makes sense to conduct its, their basic research overseas and send the results here to the United States. And that way you really don't worry about whether or not what you're doing basic research wise is uh, subject to a patent infringement action. You might say, well, who's gonna sue? Is it really worthwhile? If it's basic research in today's world, post eBay, do I have to worry about an injunction? The answer is probably no. 
And what about damages? What are the damages? Well, in the past, I might say, yeah, don't worry about them. They really can't be that much because the patentee is really not suffering any competitive injury. Jumping ahead, uh, not slide-wise, to the recent Amgen Hospira case, which had to do with stockpiling, I take a lesson from that. Even though Amgen was not injured, damaged in the marketplace, uh, it collected $70 million from Hospira. Okay, that's stockpiling. But in the past, I might say that with basic research, if you were doing it, it's almost like no harm, no foul, to borrow a term from basketball. Well, in view of the Andrew Hospera case, I don't know if that's any longer true. So it's just uh, something to keep in mind. The easy way to avoid it, of course, is to do the research overseas, the UK, Germany, Japan, most countries over there have statutes and even case law defining the research exemption. And it's quite broad, although it does vary from country to country. So Brian, next let me slide. jump in here before we go to the next slide. Um, you, the bullet point here says that Hatch-Waxman Safe Harbor does not apply until, quote, basic research is completed. Mm -hmm. Is there a bright line for when that is? I mean, how do our clients, um, the people on the phone, understand when, when they've crossed the line from basic research, where they might even be using what we get into later as a research tool, and an actual sort of research that may or may not fall under the safe harbor. Um, okay, is, there, is, there, is there a clear line for that? The basic answer or the most honest answer is probably no. But let's just hold off and we'll get into that in two shakes. Next slide, please. And our slides are taking a while to advance okay, here, yeah. so we apologize All for right, that. So here we have the Hatch-Waxman Act. I have emphasized here the term patented invention in 271A, and then the same term in 271E1. As we'll find out later, the terms mean something different as you go from 271A down to 271E1. I point out that in the past, when I gave this lecture, I would often use ellipsis in discussing the uh, compounds manufactured using recombinant DNA, so on and solely, so on and so forth, but now they play a much more important role. So those the Hatch-Waxman 271E1 safe harbor. Next slide, please. The genesis of the safe harbor, I'll start talking before we even get the slide. Uh, now, the Hatch-Waxman Act, and this is important to something I'm going to discuss later. The Hatch-Waxman Act was designed to get generic drugs to market quickly. That was its overall purpose. Part and parcel of that was the safe harbor, which came into existence to overrule the case of Roche Products v. Bolar, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. The decision delayed drug introduction and allowed a patentee to maintain its market exclusivity after any blocking patents expired. Because what you did to prepare for an FDA approval was not protected by the common law research exemption, which doesn't exist, and nothing else protected it. You were infringing. So the Congress stepped in, Hatch-Waxman Act, Safe Harbor, to facilitate getting drugs to market quickly. Now. Over the years, the scope of the safe harbor has been extended to not only drugs, but medical devices, and this is important, types one, two, and three, biologics, follow-on biologics, and biosimilars. Importantly, safe harbor does not apply to new animal drugs or veterinary biological products manufactured by recombinant DNA techniques. There's a case that cited it, it's the only one I've ever found. It's a federal circuit case. The, the discussion is dicta, and it's by a Judge White who is sitting by designation. We'll come back to that a little later. Next slide, please. And let me just jump in. You, you talked yeah. about the extension of the safe harbor to medical devices, the, you know, the various types. 
um, biologics, biosimilars, follow on biologics, et cetera. What about medical foods um, where people might be pursuing approval as a medical food um, either alone or perhaps in conjunction with also getting approval as, as a drug? I can honestly say I haven't seen a case on that, but I won't uh, go back to the previous slide, but just quoting from 271E1, it says, related to the development and submission of information under a federal law, which regulates the manufacture use of drugs, veterinary biological products. So again, even though the term is drugs, we now know it covers medical devices. I would think it would also cover medical foods. So as long as they're subject to F sorry, government regulation, doesn't have to be the FDA, which it might be, of course, I think the safe harbor would apply. Right, thank you. Okay, I throw this in here, patent term extension. Some of you, not all, might say, well, what does this have to do with the safe harbor? It's gonna come into play when we discuss research tools. Uh, Section 156, the PTE, was passed in the same time in conjunction with 271E1. Many decisions hold that the two sections go together. They were simultaneously enacted, so you can't have one without the other. What does that mean? That a patent covering a research tool, if it cannot be extended under Section 156, uh, it's not subject to the Hatch-Waxman safe harbor. So that comes into play when we discuss the research tools, but I wanted to just get rid of that section up front since it was part and parcel of the Hatch-Waxman Act. Next slide, please. Next slide, ah, here we are. The Supreme Court Integra case, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Uh, I don't think anyone has ever written a opinion uh, saying that the safe harbor applies without quoting that first sentence that says the safe harbor provides a wide berth of protection, right? Uh, re anything reasonably related, all uses, any information. You can see those words italicized. I guess that emphasizes the wide berth of protection. Well, how do we know when the safe harbor applies? Well, if something is, re we have a reasonable basis for believing that a patented compound may work for its intended purpose, the safe harbor, all other things being equal, might very well apply. Again, so Brian, uh, go ahead. I, um, maybe you could go into a little bit of the facts here in this case, just to remind people. And then, you know, I just wanted okay. to ask sort of, again, a similar question, where's the line? Um, okay. In terms of the in number. Murphy, in Murphy yeah, Integra, sorry. there were four compounds in a sense on the table. Uh, it was being looked at which one was someone going to take to market. So interestingly and importantly, there wasn't one compound on the table. So you were allowed to mix and match trial and error as the Supreme Court discusses, is all within the safe harbor. Interestingly, two of the four patents were research tool patents. Uh, the parties before the Supreme Court and then importantly on remand to the Federal Circuit, the two parties agreed that research tool patents were not part and parcel in this case. Judge Rader in a vigorous dissent on the remand explained that two of the patents, and he actually quoted the claims, uh, covered research tools. And he has a lengthy discussion of why research tools are not covered by safe harbor protection. Uh, and it's quite lengthy and it's, for some would be quite persuasive. And uh, that's the Murphy Integra case. Uh, to answer, just before we get to answering Teresa's question, just the next slide for a minute. And the, the importance of this is you see the Supreme Court here, I have quoted, and it shows the type of tests that were on the table in Merck v. Integra, and all of them were found to be within the safe harbor, right? On remand, there were 14 different types of tests that the court went over item by item. 
And just to give you a flavor, one was receptor binding assay, cell adhesion assay, rabbit corneal assay, mouse retinal assay, all of those and many others were found to be within the scope of the safe harbor. Having done this for many years, I can honestly say I've never come to a conclusion that the safe harbor did not apply because of the type of test that was being considered. So if you want, to, if you have a test and you're thinking, does the safe harbor apply or not, look at the remand in Merck v. Integra to the federal circuit. Now, getting back to Teresa's question, there is no hard line between, you know, basic research, which we know is not covered, uh, and something that is covered. Uh, there's a case that I should have mentioned. It's third wave technology versus strategy. And there's a nice quote, a remote desire to obtain FDA approval for a product is not enough. So you have to have, and again, this is not a legal term, some meat on the bones of what you're doing. And the next slide has a case that hopefully answers a little bit of Teresa's question. Yeah, I mean, I guess, Brian, you know, they tested four compounds. What if I'm testing, you know, a, a, a broad genus of compounds? And, and some might argue that it's almost high throughput screening. Um, well, interestingly, compounds. And, and we didn't what have was the goal that, you know, one of them will be advanced in the clinic, ultimately? Well, we didn't have this prepared, but interestingly, Judge Radar, in his dissent on remand, says selection of a species from a genus is subject to the safe harbor. So does that mean if you have a thousand compounds and you're looking for the one that cures cancer, you're okay? I don't think so, because remember the other requirement that you have to have a reasonable basis for believing that the compound may work for its intended purpose. So if you have high throughput screening and there's no connection, rhyme or reason, between the compounds that you're testing, uh, safe harbor may not apply. But if there is some connection, say with a, uh, a group of antibodies that have been developed, you may know that all of them are going to work to one extent or another. They're not all going to be commercial candidates, but maybe for antibodies, a different result would be achieved because quite possibly for each and every candidate, you may have a reasonable basis for believing that it would work. So you satisfy the safe harbor. And again, I apologize for not giving a more precise definition of the line between protected safe harbor and unprotected basic research. But on slide 12, if you turn to that for a second, uh, there's a case here, ISIS Spar, which is one of the few cases I really talk about this basic research and what's covered and what isn't. And it shows that, uh, well, let me just say what the same. Centaurus entered into agreement with companies to sell anti-sense discovery services, and they were going to identify and screen compounds, and they argued that the safe harbor applied. Well, the court denied a motion for a safe summary judgment on that issue, saying that they just weren't far enough along. Maybe they should have called it from the case I just did, you know, that a hope or belief that something will be subject a remote desire that something will be subject to safe harbor to FDA approval doesn't necessarily give you safe harbor protection. And then we'll see the other quote from Merck, the Supreme Court, safe harbor does not globally embrace all exp experimental activity, which at some point may lead to FDA process. Uh, again, we don't have a lot of data points, unfortunately, but I think High throughput screening uh, would be one example, maybe the far end of the timeline, if you will, that safe harbor would not apply. And as you go further and further towards a clinical candidate, you don't have to be there because even in Merck v. Integra, there were four clinical candidates on the table. Right. So we know you don't have to have one. How many, as Teresa might ask? I don't know. And if you have a reasonable basis for believing that the 10 compounds that you're testing, the 20 compounds that you're testing, 
the 30 compounds that you're testing have a, you know, have a good shot, may work, emphasizing the word may from the Supreme Court decision, right? And then quoting from Judge Rader, right? Selection of a species from a genus is the stuff of safe harbor. So each case, I guess, is sui generis, and right. each set of facts has to be analyzed based upon the specific technology, where you are on the developmental timeline, and do you have that reasonable basis for believing? More than that, uh, it's it's a hard call. Mm -hmm. Next no, thank slide. you, Brian. And this is the next slide, I guess it's 13 when we get to it. This is just something that uh, across my desk fairly recently and a question arose in drafting a complaint alleging infringement where there is a possibility of safe harbor protection of the generic or the defendant. Uh, do you have to negate that in the complaint? And the answer is definitely not. The safe harbor is a defense that must be raised by the defendant who has the burden of proving it. And uh, remember when you're developing evidence for FDA submission and you think you're within safe harbor, make sure you document that because it can be very difficult to prove that each and every act, each and every batch was protected by the safe harbor. And we have this case here, if you ever wanna take a look at it, in ray pharmaceutical compositions of an ITC. It involved uh, human EPO, and Roche had to prove that each and every vial was used to satisfy conduct subject to the safe harbor. And then recently, we saw at Amgen Hospira that I guess 14 batches uh, were not subject to the safe harbor, seven batches were. So make sure you keep detailed records and you're not gonna be able to walk in the court and just say, protected by the safe harbor. Uh, the plaintiff panties and title to put you to your proofs. So make sure you have them available. Next slide. This is another something that may not be thinking of. Uh, we all know that if you have an opinion of counsel and you're charged with infringement saying the patent is invalid, patents not infringed, that could help uh, negate the charge of willful infringement. But what if you have an you know, opinion that uh, you're within the safe harbor? And I've had occasion that we were faced with a patent that we thought might be valid, thought might be infringed, right? and we were conducting work that was arguably within safe harbor, we developed a very comprehensive opinion that we were protected by the safe harbor. Now, when the drug was approved and we went commercial, that's a horse of a different color, of course, but during this extended time period where we were subject to suit, right, we had a good faith belief and we had an opinion backing that up that we were in the safe harbor. Uh, so, even if the opinion were incorrect, I think it would still establish good faith. One other twist here that I'll throw out, uh, for inducement under 271B, a defendant must specifically intend to infringe, right? An opinion of a counsel on non-infringement is admissible and may negate that specific intent requirement. Now this comes about only when you're dealing with method of treatment patents, most likely section 271B inducement. But if you have an opinion that you're within the safe harbor, just like you have an opinion that you're not infringing, would that negate the specific intent requirement of 271B? And if you negate the specific intent requirement and later you lose, right? You have a good faith belief. So during that extended period of time, are you even subject to damages? Interesting question, right. hasn't been answered, but I just throw out, it's another benefit. And maybe it's right. not too often used because under 271B, you're usually on the market, but it's something to throw out. The other area here, Brian, that some of the listeners might be interested in um, for inducement is, you know, many startups and, and larger biotech and biopharma companies are, 
actually using CROs to do a lot of work. And so they may not be infringing themselves, but maybe, quote, be considered to be inducing infringement of certain um, patents that may or may not fall under the safe harbor. So considering sort of the action if you're contracting with CROs and whether or not um, an opinion related to inducement um, and, and whether or not the activity falls under the safe harbor for your CRO is necessary um, and could establish that, um, that good faith as well. Yeah, we're all used to preparing opinions in this area on non-infringement or invalidity, but I just want to add in or throw in the possibility that this safe harbor defense can be used in that area as well. It doesn't arise all that often, but when it does, and I've used it, it can be very potent. So next slide, please. The next two slides uh, deal mm -hmm. with the famous cases of Momenta 1 and Momenta 2. And Momenta 1 uh, was essentially reversed by Momenta 2. They deal with a, a research tool, a patented assay, which was used uh, after FDA approval on each batch to be released commercially. So this was post FDA approval conduct. In the Momenta 1, it, the court federal circuit said that that was subject to the safe harbor. There was no prohibition on having post FDA safe harbor protection. Uh, that was essentially reversed by Momenta 2. But one important thing here, or maybe two, the last two bullet points, this case dealt with a research tool, but that was not really discussed in any detail in either Momenta 1 or Momenta 2. And also in Momenta 1, which remains good law, the court noted that actual submission of information to the FDA was not necessary. Uh, so that is still good law. So even though you don't submit something exactly that you've developed or the data to the FDA, you have it in your files, uh, the safe harbor would still apply. The next slide, Momenta 2. And Momenta 2 uh, still allows for post FDA approval, right? but the circumstances are very, very limited. Uh, you have to be doing something directly related to getting a further approval, maybe a new use, maybe an amended label, and certainly the everyday use of a patented assay. Post approval is not going to put you within the safe harbor. Uh, People cite Momenta 2 for various reasons in various briefs, use it in many different ways. Uh, keep in mind that the focus of Momenta 2 often gets lost. It was a post FDA approval case. It was focused on post FDA approval conduct. So when you're faced with this or you're trying to extend Momenta, keep that in mind. Uh, Next slide, please. And we'll come back to Momenta 2 in a minute when we deal with research tools. The next two slides I thought might be useful. It just mm -hmm. kind of summarizes examples of it, exempt and non-exempt activities. We see that applies to ITC actions, medical devices, types one, two, and three. That was subject to confusion years ago because types one and two are not necessarily subject to full FDA review, but they are still within the scope of the safe harbor. Uh, submission of data to foreign regulatory agency where the data are also submitted to the US FDA. Uh, Ryan, use can, of I, a sure. can I jump in there? Um, so, you know, what if we're considering, the, cl the client is considering, you know, that maybe they're they're going to limit they're thinking at the beginning that they're going to limit their activities to, say, Asia, Japan, China, Korea, for example. Um, that's where they want to launch a product. It has the particular market there. Um, they're they're working, you know, looking at a potential partner there, for example. Um, are you saying that that there's no safe harbor there unless they have, you know, somewhere in their records that, oh, by the way, we might do this in the U.S. too? 
um, sort of at, at what yeah. point, you know, would it fall into well, the safe harbor? Is it sort of retroactive if all of a sudden they yeah. decide there's a market in the U.S. as well, or they get a partner in the U.S.? Let's just, let's use a hypothetical. I'm manufacturing a compound in the United States. You have a patent that covers the process or the compound or whatever. So all things being equal, I'm infringing in the United States. I send that compound to Europe or to Japan and they're gonna do clinical trials with it. If the clinical trials are solely for the purpose of getting an, their version of FDA approval in Europe or in Japan, the safe harbor doesn't apply. If at the same time, the clinical trial information will be used in the United States, well then it's like two for the price of one, safe harbor would apply. So to limit, to devise a you know, testing scheme uh, for a manufactured product in the United States, limiting it to uh, you know, FDA or European approval might be a little foolhardy. Uh, so if there's any possibility down the road and who knows, times change, markets change, that you might use that data in the United States. Uh, you want to account for that. And then at least you have a good faith argument that the safe harbor should apply, even though, and remember Momenta 1, you don't have to submit that FDA information to the FDA, right? So you could very well be okay when you're getting two for the price of one, as I say. But if you limit it just to European approval, approval for Asia, more than likely uh, the safe harbor is not going to apply. Okay, let's. We have slide 17. 18 has examples of non protected activity. And both of them heard before. Uh, and the key bullet point down there in slide 18 is the activity must in some way relate to potential FDA approval of a drug or a device, supplemental approval or a label modification. So uh, with that, let's go to the next slide. Sorry for the inconvenience. Slide 19. A supplying active ingredient. Now, before the Shire case that you see mentioned in the second bullet point, there was some confusion as to whether someone actually making the product for the generic, if you will, to use to develop its data for the ANDA, whether that supplier was protected by the safe harbor. And you'll see some cases in the next slide that gave rise to that confusion. In Shire case, the Federal Circuit put that to rest. So someone who manufactures or sells an API for use in the FDA trials is not subject to infringement. And the same would be true if you're manufacturing something to give to a branded pharmaceutical company to be used to develop data for the FDA submission. Okay. Now, this is limited, this case was limited to the uh, production and supply of the actual material to be used in the uh, generic application, right? One wonders what other activities that a supplier or let's say, let's say an assistant can supply to the generic, generic filer and still be protected by the safe harbor. So it's not limited just to supplying product. It could have broader implications. Next slide, please. Now, often a plaintiff patentee realizes that the person who is, or the organization supplying the active ingredient is probably protected by the safe harbor, but it would like to bring that supplier in as a potential defendant. Uh, this here is still a possibility, and we have some decisions where the patentee was able to sue not only the generic filer, but also one who assisted the filer or one who supplied active ingredients to the filer, as long as there were more facts, if you will. The most significant one is when there's a parent-subsidiary relationship between the supplier and the filer. 
uh, or there's some kind of contractual relationship and the supplier of the active ingredient will also supply commercial quantities after FDA approval. So it's not limited uh, to the actual filer of the ANDA or NDA. There may be a way to get uh, the supplier of information or product also involved in the case early on. Next slide. Stockpiling. Uh, we now know from Amgen that stockpiling is not protected by the safe harbor. Uh, Amgen received $70 million due to Hospiro's infringement. Uh, and this case, I guess, put the question of stockpiling to rest. I Brian, mentioned this. Go ahead. Can I, can I interrupt in here? Um, your bullet point says that no commercial sales ever occurred. So, you know, what were the, what, I guess, how did they get to the 70 million damages calculation there? Um, what was the injury to Amgen? If you could go into a little bit more details there, I think the audience would appreciate that. Okay, I think the next slide might help. Okay, the Amgen patents covered method of manufacturing, okay? They made 21 batches, right? And then they had to argue that each batch was reasonably related to developing information to the FDA. And the court went through, and it, it's, it's, a not, it's not a very informative decision as to why seven batches were within the safe harbor and 14 were out. They do discuss a little bit, and I have it in one of my bullet points here, why certain batches pass muster, right? But as to the other 14, you really don't get a good idea as to why they failed to meet the safe harbor test. I think the key factor in this case was Hospera's documents showed that certain batches were labeled for commercial uses, okay? Commercial, what do I have it with? Commercial inventory. And I think, although that doesn't come across totally from the case, I think that was the nail in Hospera's coffin because they went back and tried to change some of the designations and they got caught with their hand in the cookie jar, so to speak. So I think that was a key factor here. But going back to what I said earlier, uh, that the purpose of the Hatch-Waxman Act, the safe harbor was to get generic drugs to market quickly. Uh, how can you do that? If the patent expires on Monday, right? How can you be on, how can you get the generic product on the market on Tuesday, which was the purpose of the Hatch-Waxman Act and the purpose of Safe Harbor. I know when you read the statute 271E1, uh, coverage for stockpiling doesn't jump out at you. But again, if you take a step back and you look at the purpose, the underlying purpose of both the Hatch-Waxman Act and the Safe Harbor, one could make an argument that stockpiling should be allowed. Here, Amgen was not injured at all in the marketplace. It didn't lose one sale, but still collected $70 million. And that's why earlier I mentioned the Amgen case when I was talking about basic research and no harm, no foul. In the past, there were no damages to the patentee by someone using its research tool. Uh, but still nowadays, uh, because of this Amgen v. Hospera case, uh, damages in this area have to be thought of a little more carefully than maybe before Amgen Hospera. Okay, if you go to the next slide, 23, and what I'm saying about the purpose of the Hatch-Waxman Act, the purpose of the Safe Harbor, I'm not making that up. That comes directly from the legislative history of the Act and the Safe Harbor, and I quote some uh, sections of that legislative here, legislative history here. And also you'll see a footnote sort of the, where my colleague Ron Vogel and I have written some articles. Should stockpiling be protected or does that uh, allow the stockpiling, allow the full fulfillment, if you will, of the purpose of the Hatch-Waxman Act? That's a question for another day. Next slide, please. And this is dealing with a topic uh, 
uh, I often get phone calls from Teresa about most of the time I can't answer them um, because no one knows for sure the scope of protection for research tools. But I think we do know that the leading case is Covaris v. Innovus Systems, and uh, that was by the Federal Circuit in 2008. And I think it still stands today as the leading case. And the facts there, defendant asserted safe harbor protection for its sales of an optical spray machine that was used in analyzing the product subject to FDA approval. There was no question that the work being done, all the data was going to the FDA. One argument was that, well, how can the safe harbor apply because these are sales? But remember the safe harbor and I don't want to go back to the first one, it covers sales. So that argument really went up in smoke. But the FDA held, I'm sorry, the Federal Circuit held that since the devices themselves were not subject to FDA pre-market approval, they were not protected by the safe harbor. Remember, when the safe harbor was enacted, it was very simply put forward to protect a generic company. Even though it's been extended, a generic company wasn't using a research tool. A generic company was testing the, the very compound that it wanted to take to market. So the testing was kind of directly related or there was a one-to-one -one relationship between what was being tested and what was going to market. Here, we're one step removed. It's a research tool right? That's not going to market. The drug is. So the federal circuit said since the testing was not on the drug going to market, right? The safe harbor didn't apply. In addition here. Brian, let me, harbor, let me jump in here. Um, so does that mean that um, research tools that could be potentially subject to FDA approval, you know, eligible for patent term extension, um, that could be both. They could be a research tool. You brought up antibodies before, um, or they could be, you know, a therapeutic or diagnostic agent that's subject to FDA approval. Does that mean they necessarily use of those, even as a research tool, falls within the safe harbor? Well, let's jump just to jump ahead to slide 28, and maybe that'll answer part of your question. And that has to do with uh, companion diagnostics. And we start off that slide with the FDA guidance, in vitro companion diagnostic devices. These are becoming more and more popular, more and more in demand, and more and more required by the FDA before they will approve the companion drug. Since these are required, these are subject to FDA approval, even though the typical assay would be considered, right? a research tool, I think a strong argument exists that companion diagnostics are indeed covered by the same order. And then we have the quote from Momenta 2, and you see it here in the bullet point, research tools or devices that are not themselves subject to FDA approval may not be covered, and they cite the leading case, Provaris. So kind of Flipping that on its head, if a device or a tool or whatever is subject to FDA approval, I think a strong argument exists that lo and behold, they are subject to FDA approval. So that answers part of your question, I believe. And of course, the companion diagnostics in today's world are very important. I don't have a case on it. Uh, I don't know if there is one. I haven't seen it. Uh, but I think a strong argument does exist that they are covered. Now. Getting back to the basic question on research tools, uh, going back to slide, I guess, 24, in Provaris, in addition to this requirement that the conduct under conduct being charged has to be subject to FDA approval, there's another nuance that the Federal Circuit announced that since the Provaris patent, and this is that symmetry argument that we talked about earlier under 156, since the Provaris patent could not be extended under 156, it was not limited by the safe harbor. Again, since 270, since 176 and 271E1 were enacted together, 
there are some cases that say that this symmetry, this one-on-one -on -one relationship uh, has to exist. Otherwise, the safe harbor doesn't apply. But in the Provaris case, the optical spray analyzer was not subject to FDA approval. And furthermore, the Provaris patent could not be extended. So it's like two strikes and you're out. The safe harbor did not apply. So when we analyze other research tools, I guess companion diagnostics are easy because they are subject to FDA approval, right? When we get into another area, uh, is something being used as a research tool? Maybe it's a compound uh, in a patent. Patent covers a compound and you're using that compound as a tool. But the patent that covers that compound, the compound itself could be used as a therapeutic if someone wanted to take the time to develop it as a therapeutic. Does that mean that the patent could be extended and therefore at least that requirement of Provaris is met? I, I don't know the answer to that, quite honestly. I don't think we have a case like that. We do have cases saying that symmetry is required. And we have cases that say that it's not. And if you turn to page or slide 25, you'll see that there are cases going both ways uh, on this symmetry issue. But Provaris is still the leading case. It was mentioned with approval or cited with approval in the recent Momenta 2 decision, which is only a couple years old, right? So I think that's the final word on safe harbor and research tools. But again, the question of research tools is probably even more complicated than defining the dividing line between basic research, which is not covered, and other conduct, which is. That's difficult as it is, but I think this is even more difficult. Yeah, Next slide, please. Okay, this is just what I mentioned earlier, the symmetry, do you need it or not? Next slide. Okay, infringement, a lot of people are worried about research tools and are we infringing? Uh, sometimes, like I said, not sometimes, very often it's a difficult question. And just so people don't lose sleep at night, what I say is, I think you're within the safe harbor, but if you're not, what can happen? Well, if you're using, let's make it simple, an assay to develop a product and you develop a product that cures the awful virus we're facing today, you know, what happens? Well, there's no fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine, right? So you can't enjoin the sales of the final product developed by, let's take a worst case, infringing a research tool patent. You're not selling the research tool patent product, right? You're selling the final product. So lost profits are not available. If you develop data and you're worried about having it destroyed because the data was developed using an infringing research tool, don't worry about it. That's not gonna happen, all right? Jumping ahead to the next, the bottom, are you going to be enjoined from using that research tool in your developmental efforts, even if it's outside the scope of the safe harbor? Well, now we have eBay, which changed the dynamics for both permanent injunctions and also preliminary injunctions. So it would be hard pressed, I think, for anyone to secure a injunction, at least a preliminary injunction, shutting down basic research, even though an infringing research tool is being used. The one question that often arises, if you're infringing a reach through I'm sorry, a research tool patent, uh, what kind of royalties are allowable? We have one leading case, and there's one or two also, but not many, that deal with reach through royalties. That is, you develop a patent, you develop a product using an infringing research tool, that product is a big success, and therefore uh, the patentee wants to reach through and grab some of those royalties. Well, that's usually, and it's probably not gonna happen. The Halsey case is the leading case. If a party agrees to that type of arrangement, then you're stuck with it. 
right? But otherwise, in this country, at least in Europe, it's a little different. Uh, reach through royalties are going to be very unlikely. Next slide. We've talked about companion diagnostics. I have given you here uh, the FDA guidance uh, that requires companion diagnostics today. Uh, and then the quote from Amenta 2 that I mentioned earlier. The next slide. Genetically engineered animals. This came as a surprise to me. Uh, and this is why the section of the uh, wording in 271, which I have here, uh, if I get the right slide, let me just see. Yes. Uh, the 271E1 excludes new animal drugs primarily manufactured using genetic manipulation techniques from the safe harbor. Uh, what does that mean, right? In its 2017 draft guidance entitled, and I give it to you, FDA considers animals whose genomics have been intentionally altered using molecular techniques to be quote unquote new animal drugs, right? So we have the FDA classifying, categorizing these animals as new animal drugs, which throws them smack dead into the middle of the safe harbor and exclusion. So if these animals are made primarily using genetic techniques, et cetera, they're not subject to the safe harbor. And we see at least three examples in the FDA Green Book book where genetically engineered animals were classified as drugs. We have goats, chickens, and salmon. There's one case on this. It's a case by a decision, and I didn't mention it. I apologize by the Federal Circuit. It's by a District Judge White sitting by designation, and the decision discusses this issue in dicta. It's Benetech Australia v. Nucleonics. And it basically says that if it quotes this section of 271E1 saying that new animal drugs developed primarily manufactured, et cetera, et cetera, are not subject to the safe harbor. So these animals that are being created using various techniques, including CRISPR, if someone has a patent on that animal and you're using that animal to develop data for the FDA for clinical trials in vivo tests or whatever, right? Uh, you would say, oh, I'm using this to develop data for the FDA. I'm subject to the safe harbor. Not so fast. This particular creature was specifically excluded from protection of the safe harbor. So keep that in mind when you're using these animals. Now, again, is anyone going to sue? Uh, maybe. We've seen cases where this has been uh, considered an infringement. We have the famous... Southern District of New York Regeneron case, and there are probably others that are missing. So I just want to point that out to you. And it may, unless you've experienced this, it may come somewhat as a surprise. And I turn to the last slide. And that here is a little summary for you. I don't think there's anything new. Safe Harbor is broad. It's a defense. It covers just about everything. Safe Harbor is a drug that has a reasonable basis for believing. Certainty is not required, right? Submission to the FDA of the documents is not required. Again, I didn't mention this, the validation batches, particularly important for biologics because the FDA is requiring a certain number of validation batches. If the FDA is requiring them, uh, you're okay, you're within the safe harbor. Again, you can't go too far beyond that as Hosperin did and then it cost over $70 million. Companion diagnostics are probably protected. Stockpiling, although I might disagree, is not protected. Limited post-approval activities, even if a drug has been commercialized, they could still be protected. And many clients have the view that once FDA approval is achieved and they're selling the drug and they're making money, forget about safe harbor. Not necessarily true. Nine times out of 10, maybe even 99 times out of 100, you're going to be right. But there's going to be exceptions. And just don't overlook the safe harbor, even though your product has received FDA approval. 
And then the last one, harking back to just what I discussed, the genetically engineered animals, be careful if you're using them to develop data because they seemingly are specifically excluded from 271E1. And with that, I thank you. Hope I covered most of what you'd be interested in. Teresa, any comments, questions? Oh, maybe, maybe there's one question came in directly on this, the, the genetically engineered animals. Um, so someone's asking if the animal is genetically engineered to make a human drug, for example, in milk, right? So you have you know, a cow or a sheep or something making a drug in the milk, and then they purify the drug out of that milk. Would that be subject to the safe harbor? Well, the use of the animal, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's almost like a manufacturing right. mm -hmm. system. Arguably, that's not covered by the safe harbor. The milk, right, which mm -hmm. is produced, it's like there's no food of the poisonous tree. I guess the milk itself might be free and clear. But if you're we using... The, if, if we, yeah, if we look... If we look at the animal as a research tool, I know that's kind of strange. To or a, make a manufacturing process, yeah. Yeah, to make the final product. The final product is not infringing. The manufacturing process is. So I guess one could get arguably, hypothetically, an injunction, sounds crazy, against the use of the animals. <laughs> and what if that, I mean, that animal, you know, the FDA calls it a new animal drug, but, you know, if if no one is actually getting that animal approved for, you know, if it's not being approved as a production, essentially, facility um, or for other purposes, um, you know, I guess it gets to this idea of whether or not you actually have to be, um, if a research tool could be um, approved and, and uh, eligible for a patent term extension, you know, does it have to be being moved forward that way for you to be considered in the safe harbor um, if you're using it um, as a research tool and not necessarily, um, and it's not necessarily being advanced to the FDA by the patentee? Um, if one, one wanted to explore the subtleties in that direction, I would refer you to Judge Rader's dissent in the remand of the Integra case where he goes into that in some detail. Again, I realize it's a dissent, uh, but in a sense, uh, his comments, you know, anticipate the ruling in the Provaris case, which seemingly limits the scope of the safe harbor vis-a-vis -vis research tools. Okay, I think we're at the end of our time. So I'd like to take this time to thank everyone for attending. Um, please feel free to drop off if you need to. A replay of the webinar, including this question and answer session, will be posted on our website shortly. We'll also be posting a copy of the slide. I, I had seen that some people had some questions about this in the um, question and answer box. Um, I think if you just reach out to us um, and we can help connect you with our um, CLE team to make sure uh, you can download that form and, and get copies of the slides if, if you're having difficulties with that. Um, and of course, you can definitely reach out to Brian or myself. Our emails are here. Our um, bios are on our website, fr.com. Um, and again, thank you for attending. This is our fifth Life Sciences webinar series. We have a number of them coming up in the future and um, hope to see you at those as well. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much and stay safe. Thanks, Brian. Yes.